Dearly beloved, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying together, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people being penitent the absolution and remission of their sins, he pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Charge in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We sit as the choir sings Psalm 89, verses 1 to 8.
first lesson is written in the seventh chapter of the book of the Exodus, beginning at the eighth verse. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, perform a wonder, then you shall say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh and it will become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did as the Lord had commanded. Aaron threw down his staff before Pharaoh and his officials and it became a snake. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers and they also, the magicians of Egypt, did the same by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff and they became snakes. But Aaron's staff swallowed up theirs. Still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water. Stand by at the river bank to meet him and take in your hand the staff that was turned into a snake. Say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews sent me to, sit to you to say, let my people go so that they may worship me in the wilderness. But until now you have not listened. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. See, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile and it shall be turned to blood. The fish in the river shall die, the river itself shall stink, and the Egyptians shall be unable to drink water from the Nile. The Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over its rivers, its canals, and its ponds, and all its pools of water, so that they may become blood and there shall be blood throughout the whole land of Egypt, even in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and of his officials, he lifted up the staff and struck the water in the river, and all the water in the river was turned into blood, and the fish in the river died. The river stank, so that the Egyptians could not drink its water, and there was blood throughout the whole land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. Pharaoh turned and went into his house, and he did not take even this to heart. And all the Egyptians had to dig along the Nile for water to drink, for they could not drink the water of the river. Here ends the first lesson.
The second lesson is written in the fifth chapter of St. Paul's Epistle to the Romans, beginning at the 12th verse. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death came through sin, and so death spread to all because all have sinned, Sin was indeed in the world before the law, but sin is not reckoned when there is no law. Yet death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who is a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died through the one man's trespass, much more surely have the grace of God and the free gift in the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. And the free gift is not like the effect of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brings justification. If because of the one man's trespass, death exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. For just as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. But law came in with the result that the trespass multiplied, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that just as sin exercised dominion in death, so grace might also exercise dominion through justification leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Here ends the second lesson.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Bishop Hallinan, I present to you the Reverend Dr. Richard Patrick Waite to be licensed as Director of Mission and Ministry for the Diocese of Newcastle and admitted into the Fellowship of the College of Canons of this Cathedral Church. Rick, I greet you with the Fellowship of Christ. Do you believe God is calling you to this ministry? I believe that God has called me. Will you undertake this ministry faithfully, seeking God's guidance in the power of the Holy Spirit? With the help of God, I will. Brothers and sisters, will you support and uphold Rick in this ministry, serving alongside him in the name of God? With the help of God. The Church of England is part of the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, worshipping the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It professes the faith uniquely revealed in the Holy Scriptures and set forth in the Catholic creeds, which faith the Church is called upon to proclaim afresh each generation. Led by the Holy Spirit, it has borne witness to Christian truth in its historic formularies, the 39 Articles of Religion, the Book of Common Prayer, and the ordering of bishops, priests, and deacons. In the declaration you are about to make, will you affirm your loyalty to this inheritance of faith as your inspiration and guidance under God in bringing the grace and truth of Christ to this generation and making him known to those in your care? I, Richard Patrick Waite, do so affirm and accordingly declare my belief in the faith which is revealed in the Holy Scriptures and set forth in the Catholic creeds, and to which the historic formularies of the Church of England bear witness. And in public prayer and administration of the sacraments, I will use only the forms of service which are authorized or allowed by canon. I, Richard Patrick Waite, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to His Majesty King Charles III, his heirs and successors according to law. So help me God. I, Richard Patrick Waite, do swear by Almighty God that I will pay true and canonical obedience to the Lord Bishop of Newcastle and her successors in all things lawful and honest. So help me God. I, Richard Patrick Waite, declare that I will be obedient to the bishop and the chapter of this cathedral church and to their successors, that I will observe and keep all such regulations, statutes, or statutes ordinances and rules of this cathedral church according to its constitution and as agreed by the bishop and the chapter and published by lawful authority, that I will faithfully and prayerfully carry out the duties of my canonry and I will preach on those occasions demanded of me, that I will be ready to assist the bishop of the diocese with my presence and counsel whenever and wherever she may reasonably require this of me, and I, I will willingly and wholeheartedly play my part in furthering the ministry of the church in this diocese.
Helen Ann, by divine permission, Lord Bishop of Newcastle, to our beloved in Christ, Richard Patrick Waite, greeting. We do hereby collate and admit you to the honorary canonry in our Cathedral Church of St. Nicholas, Newcastle upon Tyne, which belongs to our collation in right of our bishopric. And we invest you with all the rights and duties of the said canonry and assign to you the stall of St. Paulinus in the choir of our Cathedral Church and a place and voice in the College of Canons, saving to us and our successors our Episcopal rights and the dignity and honor of our said Cathedral Church. And we do grant you license and authority during our pleasure only to officiate and preach in any church and perform other ecclesiastical duties in any parish within our diocese and jurisdiction, so long only as the incumbent assents to your so officiating in your capacity as diocesan director of mission and ministry. In testimony whereof, we have hereunto set our hand and caused our Episcopal seal to be affixed this 17th day of March in the year of our Lord 2024 and in the 10th year of our consecration and of our translation, the second. Rick, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, bless, preserve and keep you. The Lord give you grace, wisdom, faithfulness, courage and love in all your work for him now and forever. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I present the Reverend Canon Dr. Richard Waite, Diocesan Director of Mission and Ministry. Let us greet him. Thank you. having collated you to the office of canon of this cathedral, I now present you to the Dean for installation. Share in the church's ministry exercised in this place in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Rick, I place you in the stall assigned to you as canon and do effectually induct you into the real, actual and corporal possession of the same with all and singular their rights, members and appurtenances. The Lord preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore.
Spirit of God, come and rest upon us. That our songs, lived, sung, spoken and prayed, may always be of your loving kindness in this generation and those to come. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I stand at a rather peculiar intersection. At least that's how it feels. At the intersection of different kinds of prayers here on site in this cathedral this evening and with the prayers of those further afield. I am grateful and I thank you. The first of the readings that you have heard this evening places us back in the middle of plagues in Egypt with drama, miraculous signs and hardened hearts. Four years ago, in fact, probably more than four years ago, commentators noted that plagues or pandemics, as we have now learned to call them, always evoked a range of spiritual, religious and superstitious responses. What plagues then and now give rise to are priests of various kinds, people who purport to make sense of it all, to provide answers. Whether it is the miraculous serpentine staffs of octogenarian Aaron and Moses in the Exodus narrative, or those who offer new recipes for recovery and improvement in our own day. Challenges seem to begat those who offer answers for better and for otherwise. But our first lesson this evening brings with it some insights about what to expect of our ministers and our ministries in the places we pray and seek to serve. We might remember earlier in Exodus, in chapter 4, Moses receives the calling of God and responds by reminding the Almighty of his many disabling factors. His aging body, his faltering speech, meaning that he cannot possibly take on the responsibilities God has for him. The theologian John Swinton highlights that God's response is a telling one for us. That Moses, we note, isn't delivered of his circumstances to do the will of God. Moses received a calling as he was. It wasn't a calling based on what he had done or one speculatively upon what he might achieve with the right kind of investment. Moses was called precisely as he was. He was being invited to follow not on the basis of previous success or future possibility, but as one being invited to wait on God now, here, in the present. Moses was given a staff, which by the time we arrive at chapter 7, this evening's reading, is certainly a symbol of authority. But those who have ever had cause to use a stick or crutches know that it is a visible symbol of vulnerability in our own time. To have vulnerability brought to mind at a service like this one is to be reminded that to witness now, here, in the present to our faith, is not to do so as self-sufficient or complete individuals, but those who have learned dependency on God, those who hope in God's work in and through all our vulnerabilities. We are called together to remember God's faithfulness with those who have gone before us and to look for where God is working now. But not every Sunday or every gathering together brings new insight or revelation. Not every insight brings transformation into my life. I speak only for myself. Not every Sunday soothes my doubts or calms my fears. But when our focus rests on a longing for what has been, 
perhaps when we last experienced joy or belonging in a service or in a community, or perhaps when our focus is on what might yet be, the risk is that we cannot attend to the present where God is working, a present that includes God working through those things that feel like vulnerabilities, a lack of resources, an aging community. We must attend to God working in the present so that, like Moses, we can learn to see that vulnerability is one of the places where God is looking to work with us. We are not waiting for another strategy to beat back church decline. We are waiting to encounter God. Or to put it in the language adopted by this diocese, we are not seeking or sharing or sending to do more activity. We are engaging in seeking to encounter God. In Romans 5, Paul's vision echoes this. Paul envisages a place, a present and future home, not shaped like Rome by dominion or best or most or wealthiest or cleverest or highest or fastest. Paul envisages a present and future home shaped by an encounter with God in Christ crucified. An encounter with God that leads us to wonder about alternative responses when we encounter difference, vulnerability, woundedness, what others choose to call enmity. It is this faith into which the church has been baptized. This baptismal mission and ministry is framed by Gemma Simmons as part of our belonging to Jesus, a prophet, a priest, and a king, and a longing for this new home. Mother Gemma reminds us, when we live prophetically, we call one another to the presence of God within the world. And we live prophetically when we speak truth to power and proclaim the demands of God's justice on behalf of the voiceless, on behalf of those within and without the walls of our churches. We show our belonging with Jesus in a priesthood of all believers when we serve as those who long to build bridges, to build a culture of encounter between people between God's as God appears in God's image in one another. When we help encounter God in the world, especially where there has been disregard, distance or disengagement. We show our vocation together as belonging with the servant king whom we follow in Passion Tide and Holy Week when we live the Beatitudes in our daily lives, when we hope for blessing in all sorts of circumstances that look otherwise, that look like poverty, meekness, grief, injustice, mercy, peacemaking, persecution, and exclusion. The most faithful churches arrived where they are in the present, not because they were always the most skilled, energetic, creative, and determined. One notices amongst these faithful communities of every size and style and place, the ways that they waited, listened for the odd and beautiful forms of collaboration that take place they are the places who celebrate God working with us and celebrate more when they notice God working with others. There is always the temptation to do more. The acceleration toward more and new usually takes us away from listening and from waiting on that encounter. 
doing less is hard because it involves change. Changing the focus from activity towards what is actually shaping our life together. Changing to attend to the ways a community can be more open to that ministry that celebrates God working, encountering God in all kinds of people and circumstances. May God give us the grace to see it, to seek it when we cannot see it, to wait when we are tired of seeking, and to trust that he will come and meet us on the way. The one whom we follow this Passion Tide Holy Week and beyond, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. God of every perfect gift, we give you thanks that you have called your servant Rick to serve in this our diocese. Renew in him the gift of your Holy Spirit, as in the name of the Lord Jesus, we welcome him to serve amongst us. Strengthen the gifts you have given him that the ministry and mission of your people may bear fruit. Inspire him when he leads worship, preaches, teaches, and serves. May the gospel be celebrated when he presides at sacrament. Bless him with love in the leadership of your people. Give him power and patience to witness with all your church to your way and to work with all people of goodwill for justice and mercy in society. Watch over him in times of trial. Keep him from complacency or spiritual pride. Fill his home with your peace. Give grace to the people of the team to which he will be called to lead, that we may accept the service God offers us through him. May we all work together for the glory of your name and may the good work you have begun today be brought to completion in Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In faith, we pray to God who is more ready to hear than we are to ask. We pray for the whole church of God in this our diocese that rejoicing in our richness and variety, we may seek peace and unity and be constantly renewed for mission and service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the members of the mission and ministry team, for all who work alongside them, that under Rick's leadership, rejoicing in their shared mission, they may strengthen each other and be built up in love and power. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the life of the world in our diocese, that rejoicing in our common humanity, we may reject the ways of conflict and work together for justice and for peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We rejoice in the communion of saints that strengthened by their faithful example, we may follow the way of Christ and live to God's praise and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us wisdom, Lord, to know your will. Give us courage to do it. May our words declare your love and may our compassion give substance to our words. May the God of love stir up in each of us the gifts of his grace and sustain each of us in our discipleship and service. And 
may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. The Lord bless you and watch over you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look kindly on you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>